right, everybody, we had our coffee. We have so little to do and so much time to do it in. Oh, strike that. Reverse it. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce another physician who will speak to you about medical cannabis, Julie Mulkey. Thank you. And can you all hear me? Wonderful. Um, I must say that it's wonderful to be here today, first of all, because um, being a, a Danish uh, doctor, it's nice to come here with um, my squad. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but also because I think it's really wonderful that we are beginning to have these conversations here in Scandinavia. I've oh, this one, sorry. Okay. Um, it's wonderful to have these conversations with uh, patients, with doctors and um, with the industry. Um, I've been to a lot of conferences uh, around Europe um, and it's also just nice to be back uh, after the pandemic to be able to, uh, to gather like this um, and, and talk about how we can educate ourselves. Um, public education is really important and the education of doctors and healthcare professionals is one of the cornerstones to getting more access um, to patients. So. Yeah, my name is uh, Julie Molke and uh, I'm uh, educated at uh, Copenhagen University. Um, I finished in 2016 um, and uh, since then I've been working with mental health. Um, and for four years I've been working uh, in the medical cannabis industry, uh, primarily with uh, CBD. Um, so what I will talk about today um, is my work um, and um, what I have experienced along the way, and I will talk primarily about CBD um, and uh, the research study that I published last year. Um, and um, then you can uh, feel free to ask me any questions after. It's going to be a pretty short presentation. Um, so first I want to tell you why I um, decided to, go how I got into medical cannabis and CBD. And there was a bit um, of a coincidence, I did my residency in the north of Denmark in uh, 2016 and, um, and there I worked as a GP um, and um, it was uh, really shocking to me. I had spent all those years in medical school uh, and I thought now I was going out to help people. And then one patient after the other came in with their stress and their anxiety and like... I didn't really have any tools to help them um, and people came with that chronic pain and we had a lot of drugs to, but they didn't, didn't help them um, and um, there were a lot of side effects and people became addicted and so I was a little bit um, dis or like disillusioned when I finished my residency or my audition as it's called in Sweden. Um, and um, I, I thought that uh, I wanted to be able to offer my patients more tools. Um, so then I, um, I decided uh, that I wanted to look into how can I better as a doctor help uh, people with mental health concerns like um, stress, anxiety, depression with the other tools that, that I learned in medical school. Um, and uh, I myself was in a pretty stressed uh, period of my life because I was taking over my family farm, which is here in Sweden, which is in the south of Sweden, um, and the family business. And at the same time, I was trying to figure out what kind of doctor do I want to be. Um, and um, and, and uh, so I decided that I wanted to take an uh, education as a stress therapist. Um, and at the same time, I did a yoga teacher training and learned about mindfulness because I thought that those could potentially be tools to help myself, but also to help my patients. Um, and I started um, getting an interest as well for um, medical cannabis and CBD. And this actually was an interest which was sparked by my patients in the clinic because I met a lot of people who asked, um, can you advise me on CBD? I would like to use CBD. And as a doctor, I just I, I, I had to tell them, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't actually know what to tell you. Um, so I thought I'd better look a little bit m closer at this. Um, and then we have 2018 and I moved to London with my um, husband. 
uh, who is English, and there I suddenly, by chance, get an, uh, the, the option to work really closely with the, the medical cannabis industry because at that time it was booming in the UK. There were like tons of CBD companies uh, that started and lots of patients' organizations and conference, conferences. And so this company called The Drugstore gave me um, the option and the funding to start um, a blog about medical cannabis and CBD. And so I spent half a year researching, um, the re like looking into the research, researching the research, um, to, to uh, like learn what, like what kind of studies do we actually have. Um, and um, I, I can totally understand that doctors don't know how to advise their patients, because when you look at PubMed, which is like the database of, of the scientific research, um, and you type in medical cannabis, you get more than 20,000 uh, articles coming up. So where do you start? That's like, that's one. CBD, 10,000. And just to compare it to something like gabapentin, which we've used for decades, there's only 8,000 uh, articles coming up. So there's a lot of research and it can be very difficult to figure out how to start. Um, and um, so, so I, I, I looked into the research. Um, one document that I found really useful and which I can recommend if anyone is interested in looking at the research is the Academy of Sciences report, uh, an American academy that looks into the, the research. And there they, they list all the research for different indications. I'm sorry that I don't have a presentation. If you need any of this, please contact me after and I'll send you. Um, but, um, but yeah, the, the Academy of Science, they, they, they look at all the indications and then they say how strong is the evidence. Um, and as some of, uh, some of our speakers today have explained, the, um, it can be used um, and there is like moderate evidence uh, that it can help treat chronic pain, especially uh, neuropathic pain, as Tina knows very well. I, I also work in Tina's clinic um, uh, and uh, multiple sclerosis. It can be really useful for the spasms there. Um, also in the palliative uh, care and for nausea um, and, uh, and pain during chemotherapy um, and, uh, and for epilepsy. These are like some uh, of the conditions where there is really good research. Um, uh, but then, of course, we have all the other indications where there is there is no like scientific evidence that can support it yet, but hopefully we will get there in the future. So I also wrote articles about um, the data and the um, also the real life data, so just uh, case reports that we have uh, about ADHD, ADD, uh, the psychiatric conditions like anxiety uh, and, and, and sleep, uh, like insomnia, um, and uh, and some of you mentioned earlier Alzheimer's disease. There is like good um, like uh, lab data looking at this, and uh, you were also talking uh, about PTSD, which is also another promising one. And, there, and there, there's just there's so many um, indications because of the endocannabinoid system. So this was what I really like got into the matrix of of the of the science to try to understand uh, the endocannabinoid uh, system in the cannabis plant. Um, and then uh, in 2019, I met uh, Tina um, at the uh, ICM conference in Berlin. Um, and, uh, and I started uh, working uh, in your pain clinic in Copenhagen, uh, prescribing. Um, and um, at the same time, I also started a holistic practice. And this is where I really used the CBD a lot um, because uh, now I, had I, I felt that I had finally gathered after like some years uh, more tools to help people in a more integrative way so I don't see cannabis as a, a, a one cure for, for, for all of these conditions but as a part of a puzzle um, and um, it's like a, a tool in the toolbox and as we heard it can help some people and for other people uh, it, it maybe doesn't have an effect but also sometimes it can be great in combinations with other combination with other modalities. Um, so in my holistic practice, um, I'm, I consult um, my clients, helping them to tailor specific plans. And very often I use CBD um, and um, this can be together with, let's say, uh, breathing or uh, mindfulness or wh whatever is needed for this specific client. I also use functional testing where I look at, let's say, female sex hormones or stress hormones and, and try to see how, how can we um, like help people uh, in, in the best personalized way. 
Um, and, um, and some of the conditions that I have found um, and experienced uh, are responding really well to CBD is um, stress, which is, of course, not a proper diagnosis, but still so many people suffer from it and like are invalidated and can't work because of stress. Um, so I've, I think it's something that we have to take very seriously as a society and, and it's something that I work um, with a lot of uh, clients with. Um, stress, anxiety um, and, um, and sleep problems. Um, and, um, and this actually uh, leads me to this research study that I did. I, this is not an RCT or anything like that, uh, um, but uh, it's a cross-sectional um, study uh, of uh, 400 CBD users because I wanted to look into what are the main reasons for these 400 people um, to uh, to use, uh, s s like why they use CBD. Um, and um, I recruited uh, through like pa like databases uh, uh, because when I use CBD, it's not prescribed um, uh, through a clinic. It's uh, as a food supplement. So I wanted to look at this population, which is uh, uh, pe people who are not really patients in the traditional way, but but who are still suffering from uh, debilitating uh, conditions. And um, my results uh, from this study was that. Um, the the first reason uh the 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 main reason or like yeah the top reason was uh, for anxiety that was 42.6% of uh, of the users who said that they took it to to help uh, deal with anxiety uh, the second uh, reason um was stress 42.5% of the users in this population um, and then the third was uh, sleep problems, which was about 40 percent. Uh, this was followed by um, for general uh, health and, and well-being, which was 34 percent, and then chronic pain. Um, and if you look at uh, the uh, the sort of like biology beh behind that, it is plausible, as you said. Um, it is. Um, it's it's a, a very complex way that CBD works in the body. Not only does it inhibit uh, the fa fatty acid hydrolysis, hydrolysis but it also um, uh, interacts with the serotonin receptors that are involved with psychiatric and mental health, and uh, the GABA receptors. Um, so 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 it can be explained from this biological standpoint. Um, and of course, this was a tiny study. This is nothing that's like big enough to um, like convert the uh, our the oppo opponents of CBD and medical cannabis. But I think that of course, like we need to have these small studies to be able to move into the bigger RCTs later on. Um, and this leads me to uh, the closing of this talk, um, where I'm, I'm, I would like to talk a little bit about the future um, of, uh, of CBD. And uh, I think that one thing which is uh, super important um, is to figure out where what is CBD actually? Um, because right now uh, it's uh, it's a drug in uh, in most places. It's, it's approved as epidiolex, which is approved for epilepsy in children, even here in Sweden. Um, and then it's also a food supplement, um, and uh, and it's uh, in some places it's not a food supplement. So in Denmark and here in Sweden, you're actually not allowed to buy it to ingest it. Um, and this really leaves uh, consumers, so to say, or patients or clients or whatever, in a very vulnerable position because if like what what's actually the law like what what how, how can i get access um to this and can i get it a prescription um um so so i think that we we really need to address this issue um and um and of course i think it's really important that we continue with this these kind of events where uh, everybody's uh, where you can get to uh, like your voice out uh, as a patient and um uh, as all the different groups in the industry um and of course we like my my goal when i started get the dose which i i'm no longer the owner of that that went um that is a bit more commercial now it's not only medical cannabis and cbd but my goal with that was was to help inspire, so to say, um, my fellow uh, doctors, because I think in general there is a bit of a distrust to anything which is a so-called al alternative, even though alternative just means that it's not gone through um, like some kind of uh, RCT study. Um, and I just think it's important that we get uh, the opportunity to integrate all these um, modalities. 
Um, yeah, so uh, at the moment I, um, uh, I, I also work as a scientific advisor in the industry um, and um, I advise companies that want to work with CBD or sell CBD. Uh, this can be uh, uh, companies that are in the like food supplement industry. So um, yeah, feel free to look at my webpage, it's Dr. Julie Molke. Um, and if you have any questions um, to this talk, uh, please feel free to reach out or say them now. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Okay. 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 Yeah. All right. There is a question. <laughs> Perfect. One moment. Yeah, Dr. Tina here. Um, many of our patients, they ask us if we have an opinion about using CBD that's produced from hemp or for high potent uh, plants. And the discussion is, does it's a, chemi it's a chemical formulation, uh, if you see uh, it very isolated, but what, uh, do you have an opinion of, uh, of the effect from either the hemp uh, plant or the the high potent plant, and what about the terpenes uh, in that uh, relation also? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think in general, um, my experience is that if you can use a, a broad spectrum product, it's uh, it has it's a lot more effectful. But I um, I, I can't say that I have uh, know any data. Uh, on this, but uh, my experience is also that um, working, uh, I was like, I had a client from Japan, and there uh, at the time they c you could only get it from from hemp, and um, and the um, the effect was was definitely uh, uh, less than uh, than if you could have had it from a high potent uh, strain. But of course, this is just like clinical experience, so it's not really anything that that I would be confident guiding. Um, yeah, guiding patients on. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's a difference between high potent, you say, but isn't it the amount per milligrams that you're after regarding broad spectrum, for example, the milligram, the amount of CBD and CBG and... and yeah, so yeah definitely. That's, that's also why it's like like you know if you look at it um it's that is how it should be but then like as you know when you work with the cannabinoids you find that they're very often like these little s like differences that you can't necessarily explain um and often they come down to like what are the uh, like the the other uh, ingredients uh, active ingredients in uh, in in that like is in the strain or yeah like what is the the, the chemova yeah, yeah. S like CBG, for example, we heard a little bit about that. Yeah, it's very difficult to product or produce or find. <laughs> I yeah. don't know. So, uh, is there? Have you noticed in different aspects, different compounds? Like if it's more CBG or more? Of I have only worked very little with CBG. Okay. Uh, I know, like a company called Inecta, uh, they uh, they make uh, c CBG products, and I had like one client. Who who wanted to work with that um, for sleep, um, and it worked really well. But again, it's like w one client. I, I haven't worked much with it. Um. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So I I don't use medical cannabis because I don't want the THC. Mm -hmm. I can't I can't handle that. My body can't <laughs> handle THC. Yeah. So, but I've noticed the difference when I use a lot of amount of CBG in a broad spectrum oil when when it's not there. So that's why I'm asking about the yeah, yeah, the yeah. the constitution, and I also find that um, a, a lot of the the patients that I work with who are stressed or have anxiety, they in general have a bit of a hypersensitive nervous system, and they cannot tolerate THC. So, uh, as wh what you say is like uh, it's really on point because 
even if there's like small amounts of, of THC in, they can l actually r like have a, the opposite effect. They, it's not calming at all for them and, uh, and they will need to change to a different uh, product. Um, whereas of course, and, and I can't explain this biologically, but, um, but it's just what I have seen in, in many uh, of the clients that I work with. It's not on. Yeah. Um, so we heard you and all your <laughs> colleagues today, uh, and most of you sound like you don't really see any dangers in patients using cannabis. There's not so many negative side effects. Um, so would you think it was safe enough for patients to grow their own cannabis? <laughs> um, if, if there's, I mean, apparently there's so many strains and people react differently to certain strains so could they grow their own i mean um i don't really know like um you can just look at canada and and california and i think it's probably pretty safe isn't it millions of people yeah. have grown their own yeah and so as far as i know no one died from it exactly unless a light hit them on the head or something yeah or it was contaminated soil or something like Maybe. that. Maybe. Yeah. So it's probably safe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi. First, I want to tell you, uh, you're going to have a, a big wall to get it inside this legal, okay? This is the first thing. The second thing is that this research that you've done, this is something that is positive to human being. That is? It's positive. It's give a, a feeling of, a, of liveness to live, to, to, to take care about himself, to be positive, and that's make the body healthy. That is no good for the system because they need to sell their drugs. So if they, this thing will go inside, their drugs is not going to be sell. And this is a big industry. And you have a fight to put it inside. I wish you good luck. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> ja. Hej, jag heter Fredrik. Jag hey. är patient till en läkare i regionsvården. Penilla Ackermark. Och jag är väl tacksam för det jobbet du gör. Eh, Penilla hörde av sig till, mig, till dig ifrån rekommendation av mig för att jag skulle få bättre vård. Tack. <applåder> Tack. Okej. Okay. Okay. Are we ready for our next act? Five minutes? Okay, five minutes. So, how many of you have heard of 420? 420. 420 is a code that stoners use and perhaps other people that aren't stoners, to say, hey, it's time to have some cannabis. And April 20th is a big stoner holiday in the United States and in other places in the world. And Angelica wanted me to tell the story, how did 420 happen? So I'll tell you the story very quickly. 50 years ago, in San Rafael, California, there are a group of high school kids, and they're all boys, of course, and they used to meet after school at 4.20 p.m., and they would share cannabis together, and they would share it. There was a park near the school with a statue of Louis Pasteur. And there was a wall in front of the statue, and they used to sit on the wall at 420, and they shared cannabis together. And they are called the Waldos because they sat on a wall. And they're still alive, 
and they still consume cannabis together, and they're still the best of friends. And now, 50 years later, 420 is this code that we use. It's also a giant holiday. And if you don't celebrate 420 in Sweden or Europe, you will soon. I promise you, any April now, you will have a giant festival in the street, and maybe you'll have some music, right? And maybe you'll have some cannabis, and maybe you'll have some CBD, and maybe you'll have people selling some hemp clothes. And that is how 420 got started. And the way it was popularized, actually, was on the Grateful Dead tour. So when the people, when the hippies on the Grateful Dead tour heard of this 420, they started to make stickers that said 420 and T-shirts that said 420. And all of a sudden, everywhere you went, you saw 420. And then High Times Magazine started having 420 everywhere. And now it is huge. So it just goes to show you, you're never too small to hit the big time.